This is Wendy Halley, and you're listening to Lucid Cafe. Welcome to this special quarantine cocktail hour edition of Lucid Cafe. I hope you're finding ways to stay sane and, of course, healthy during this surreal time. For many of us, this has been a really difficult and challenging time. Just hang in there and remember that you're a badass. I'm hoping today's episode will be a thought-provoking distraction from all the craziness. I'm such a big fan of today's guest. In fact, it's safe to say that he is my favorite human being. My first conversation with John Halley back in 1997 felt more like a reunion with a very dear old friend. A stunningly attractive dear old friend. Happy to say we've been best friends ever since. John is a reserved guy who thinks very deeply about values, morals, and the kind of person he aspires to be. He also has an incredibly large brain and is the smartest guy I know. Like I said, I'm a big fan. I'm very thankful that John, despite his reluctance, indulged me and agreed to come on the show to have this thought-provoking exchange about topics I believe are vital for all of us to consider. I hope you enjoy this conversation with my husband, John Halley. Well, I'll, I'll get started. Welcome everyone to <laughs> This is this is gonna go great. Yeah. All right. I was gonna say Welcome everyone to the Saturday night Halley cocktail hour. I'm here with my lovely and gracious husband John the 21st century Viking, minus the raping and pillaging. I may have pillaged a little bit in my day. Really? You're so honest. (laughs) Mm. So, speaking of honesty, it's it's a uh, a nice transition. Anyway, I've been wanting to have you on the show pretty much since I started it, because you are by far the most ethical person I know. Wow. In my life. <laughs> you should make some better circles. <laughs> uh, well, and I only know four people. So ah, that could be part of it. <laughs> I thought it would be really cool to pick your brain about certain ethical things, but one of the most important topics to me, and I know we've talked about this, is my concern about deception and how much we lie to ourselves and lie to each other. Uh, I really feel like it's the biggest problem the human race faces. That's just my own take on this. But I'm curious about what your take is on, I'm curious, do you believe it's ever appropriate to lie? You would have to almost do little thought experiment type scenarios that would almost never happen in your life. Like say someone is broken into your home (laughs) and has got a gun to the head of your loved one and they're going to kill them unless you tell them what they want to hear that might be a case that could justify lying but apart from weird things that are never going to happen like that i think no and that's come coming from someone who did a whole lot of lying for a good chunk of his life (laughs) fascinating so I'm really curious how you got from being a guy who lied a lot to being a guy who doesn't. Yeah, well, I lied for all sorts of reasons when I was younger. I lied to get what I wanted. I lied to get people to do what I wanted them to do. A lot of times I lied just to see if I could get people to believe it because I was pretty arrogant (laughs) and it made me feel superior if I could just spin some bullshit story and get people to buy it, I somehow felt a little puffed up from that inside. 
I was young. <laughs> right. When did you reach a point where you were evaluating that and well, questioning it? Or what caused you to evaluate even, it and question it? Even at that time when I thought nothing of lying to almost anyone, I was incredibly angry whenever anyone I found out anyone was not being truthful with me. The old double standard, huh? Oh, quite the double standard, but uh, it, it enraged me sometimes. And I was like, well, it was an example of, well, this person obviously has no respect for me if they're lying to me. They don't care. Okay. And eventually that disparity of the two ways of being <laughs> in my head and the way I wanted other people to be stood out to me. And I saw that I was actually being full of shit with myself. Uh, it's really hard as a human to not be full of shit. Our brains are wired to be full of shit. I am fond of saying that we are all full of shit. It actually takes a lot of work on a daily basis to try and limit how much you are, in fact, full of shit. We are inclined to not believe things we don't want to be true. And if there's something we want to be true or something that uh, agrees with our opinion, because a lot of what we think is true is really just, just our opinion, if it's agreeing with us, we'll glom right onto it and just, all right, that's that's good information. And we're kind of, our brains are wired to rule out anything that disagrees with us because it sets up dissonance in our little brains. You're talking about confirmation bias? Confirmation bias. It's a big one. If you don't really take the time and energy to look at this stuff, it goes on completely under your own radar. When I realized that I'm okay with me lying to pretty much everybody, but I'm okay with no one lying to me, I kind of realized I was full of shit. All right. Was there a, an actual specific event that got your attention? No, it was just in reflection, I think. It, it, and it wasn't like a big light bulb going off moment. It it's kind of gradual. It just kind of crept in, but in a probably in a relatively short period of time because I tend to obsess about ideas in my little brain. <laughs> really? Quietly. I hadn't well, noticed. It's one of the reasons I'm so quiet. I'm always thinking about shit. <laughs> and you love podcasting in this way. You love hmm. being interviewed. Oh, yeah. It's my favorite thing in the world <laughs> is to be prompted to talk. With a microphone in your face. Yeah. So this dissonance started creeping up into your psyche and getting your attention is that the, the yeah. dip and 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 then I took a deep dive on it and realized that okay you're full of shit and you don't want to be full of shit so what needs to change and I looked I just thought about truthfulness and the lack thereof and it kind of made sense well I seem to have figured it out right on the one half of the equation which is how I want people to relate to me, which is I want them to be 100% honest all the time. Okay. So it was easy to balance the scales and say, well, it makes sense for me to do that too. The so as not to be a hypocrite. That and also I just saw it as a better way to be. Think about it. Like a lot of people have certain categories in their life where they think it's okay to lie. If it's to spare someone's feelings, that's really just a way of saying, well, I don't think this person can handle the truth. And it doesn't mean you need to be an asshole when you're conveying what you deem to be the truth. There's plenty of room for tact and compassion and kind delivery, but you don't need to lie. Well, and I think that's probably the most common, as I ask the question a lot when I'm teaching, it, like say CCV, I'll ask the students if it's appropriate to the subject we're talking about is it okay to lie? Is it ever okay to lie? And, and everyone will pretty much nod their heads immediately. And then they think about it. Then they'll start a really interesting debate amongst themselves. And typically the response is, well, to save someone's feelings. They don't feel it's appropriate to be cruel or unkind to someone. But there's several things in there that are just examples of how people haven't maybe thought deeply about this. Because you're not, in fact, being unkind when you're giving a difficult truth. You're actually being very kind and you're showing a lot of respect because you're esteeming this person enough that 
Yeah, they can handle this. I, I think they can know I'm not just being a jerk. Well, you hope. Yeah, you hope. But even if even if they take it that way and they wind up thinking you're a jerk, you haven't done anything wrong. Maybe that person needs to have a tougher skin. There is that. And there's also, the I think, the, the important step of waiting for the invitation. I think oh, just... yeah, that's one I learned a lot because I used to, back in the days when I used to lie, before I had really thought about a lot of this stuff, I was also more than willing to volunteer <laughs> my wisdom to anybody. <laughs> so when you were truthful, your timing was shitty. Yeah, and it was it was really just about shoving my ideas down someone's ear holes. Where no, I learned I probably learned it from you. The uh, <laughs> to shove <laughs> the, no <laughs> the wisdom of waiting for an invitation, waiting for an appropriate opening to. Because if if the opening isn't given, the person's not going to be receptive anyway. Right. So you're really just stroking your own ego if you're spouting your truth at somebody when they didn't ask for it. Well, there's a readiness factor, too. Yeah. Of if somebody's asking. Yeah, and that's why I, I warn all my friends and family members. I, I reiterate it many times over the years, so people just got that as a baseline. If I go to John with something, he's going to tell me the truth. I might not like it. That's why nobody goes to you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it gives me more time to think about these things. I'm not being badgered by. <laughs> but that's actually, I mean, that's how you want to be known though, right? That's, you want. Oh, yeah. And it's not so much how I want to be known. That's, I think, secondary. It's how I want to live. Once I dove in to this idea, I realized that's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be somebody who was honest. Uh, because I essentially found, again, apart from those wacky outlying examples, I found it to be bullshit to be any other way for me. As I said earlier, it's hard enough not to be full of shit. If you see something that you can change because you're aware of it, change it. And I'm much happier in my skin living this way than I used to be. Let's say someone asks you, Hey, do I look fat in this? Or, uh, well, let's just say. No, no that's classic, a good example. Classic, that's a classic one. Yeah, it's a classic one. Do I look fat in this hat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, that's a it's a common question in our household. Yeah, does yeah. this tie make my ass look big? <laughs> <laughs> so, there's the instances when people are asking that that they actually they don't want the truth, which is tricky. They're just wanting somebody to feed them right, and what they I, want to hear. I think, because you probably know better than to ask me things like this, <laughs> if you were in that st in that particular <laughs> state of mind. But if someone was to do that, I would probably crack a bit of a smirk and look at him and say, you want the truth? <laughs> <laughs> Which pretty much answers the question, you look like shit. Yeah. Or maybe, no, maybe it's unflattering clothing that makes you look, you're asking if it makes you look fat. Yeah, well, maybe that makes you look fatter. We all have different bodies. <laughs> some things are going <laughs> to, some things are going to highlight them and some things are going to maybe show stuff you don't want to be showing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. And, well, part of me thinks, well, if my, my, my brain works differently. Uh, it sure does, John. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if if they're asking me, maybe they're asking me because they don't want to go out in this outfit if it makes them look fat. And what's the point of lying to you? Because then you're going <laughs> to go out in public wearing something that you think you look great in and it actually makes you look fat. So you're really doing... doing I'm doing a, public, is... doing a public service. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> About how old were you when you came to this conclusion, where you started contemplating I, I your relationship? I really with was taking honesty. the deep dive. Uh, it was after we were together, so that post nineteen ninety seven, ninety eight. So somewhere in there, you you were part of the germ of that. It was, well, I was never really in relationships like this before. <laughs> yes, that's that's how the story goes. <laughs> Then nobody thought it would last. And really, nobody so I wound up did. thinking about a lot of things that had never occurred to me to think about, and a lot of them about myself. Wanting to, uh, for 
lack of a better example, bring my best game to the table to see what this was going to be. Well, you know, there is something about relationships that kind of inspires that, I think, Mm -hmm. especially when it's a really solid, good relationship. You want to bring your best self forward. Mm -hmm. And I think it does help you to sort of examine yourself in a, in a way that you wouldn't on your own. Yeah. And it had me thinking a lot about more than I ever had about communication because I was in this new paradigm of having to communicate <laughs> yeah, in a meaningful way on a regular daily basis. Yeah. And what is better communication than being honest with each other? There's, there's nothing. So that was certainly, yeah, I will drink to that. That was cert- certainly a germ that led to the sprouting of these ideas. I have been equated to a germ before. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily maybe in the way you're thinking. <laughs> Well, we're all viruses, so yeah, this is because we're humans. This is the quarantine edition of the Lucid Cafe podcast. Maybe this is well. It's certainly an idea that comes from spending so much time in my head and not an overwhelming amount of human interaction. But I've spent a lot of time wondering why people avoid thinking about these things in depth. What do you think? Well, Mrs. Halley, (laughs) I think it's like anything when you have revelations, you start wondering, why isn't everybody else thinking the same way I I am about this? No, I think that's true. It's kind of like, um, yeah, it's when something peaks in your psyche, it comes to the foreground. It it seems so obvious. Mm. Why hasn't everyone else in the world come to this, uh, come to find out it's not the case because we are 95 to 99 percent unconscious when we're awake mm. that's that's what i suggest yeah and and this didn't happen overnight for me and you can sort of look back you can pick examples of things like this we're getting away from lying and more into ethics with this one but ethics change over time there's plenty of examples well this is one dear to me uh how humans treat animals For a long time, I believe it was Descartes who sort of threw it out there that all non-human animals are just automatons. They're just little biological machines. No consciousness, no emotions, no no soul, whatever the soul is supposed to be. A little bit of ground has been given on that over the last 50, 60 years. Where, I mean, humans in general are still only willing to give personhood or consciousness credence to certain animals where it's undeniable most most people anymore think yeah dolphins yeah we we should treat dolphins and whales better because they're smart (laughs) right (laughs) they're showing examples of consciousness or personhood in ways that that we can compare to our own and say yeah and dogs cats have gotten some because they live so closely with us and and once but fuck the cows yeah fuck the cows (laughs) (laughs) They don't count. Yeah, that, no. Unless they're between two burger buns. I'm pretty sure most people would give it to dolph- orcas, dogs and cats, maybe chimps, but they'll still draw a line. Right. Which will have to be redrawn again once uh, a lot of times it's science catching up. For the longest time, nobody looked into other animals besides us have consciousness or emotions. And once scientists actually started doing some studies, even though anybody who had a dog for the last couple thousand years knew that that this is a conscious being, <laughs> this is someone who has emotions, who thinks about things, you if you live with them, you see it, it's obvious, but that's anecdotal, and a lot of studies were done, so ground was was given there. But I guess the interesting ethical conundrum there is. All right, well, one, we've been proven to be wrong about our human-centric way of looking at all life, that it's it's us, we're special, nothing else has consciousness, even though we can't define consciousness yet in a <laughs> yeah, it, in a really solid way. It, well, it's pretty mysterious. But you kind of know it when you see it, at least when it's really obvious. A lot of being able to see it is just removing some veils from your eyes of how you were conditioned to think about things. 
Well, I think maybe that ties into our ability to have relationships or relate to mm. these other conscious seeming creatures. Yeah. But then I think, you know, with my take <laughs> is that, <laughs> yeah. And I know you're not on board completely with my take because you haven't had my experiences, mm. but the ability to be in relationship with other creatures on the planet, just because we don't know much about consciousness, it, there's a, a lot of room there. Oh, there is. And I mean, just look at all the, the plant studies. If we talk about plants having a degree of intelligence, oh, which yeah. they seem plants, to do. Plants will, in, in times of stress or when a pathogen, something comes into the air, will send out different chemical signals that other plants downwind will pick up and take measures to protect themselves. Uh, a whole lot of information seems to travel through mycelium. Yeah, good old uh, mushrooms. Yeah, but not many people will look at a plant and think, well, that might be a conscious creature, just in an incredibly different way. Exactly. Than that's That we was are. my point from before, is and, that it's just alien to the way we are. Yeah, and that's one of the greatest human failings and the sources of most of the fucked up shit in the world, is that humans see everything through a compare against us lens. We're pretty Where great. They're... No, we're we're pretty horrible. <laughs> there there are plenty of us who are great. I'm a I'm a very compassionate and open minded misanthrope. It's true, folks, he is. Depends on where you zoom your lens. I can zoom in on a individual and and that's one perspective and then zoom out and look at the species and it's a different perspective. But that's maybe a whole other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the the point is that we we have this tendency, and again, it's partly about how our brains are wired, in that we compare everything to ourselves, and that's that's the standard. Whereas there's many types of intelligences. You can't do what a bee can do. <laughs> Bees seem to be pretty intelligent. They communicate with each other. They give information via a weird little dance they do. Nature's fascinating. There, there's from my perspective, examples of probable consciousness everywhere you look. Oh, and here's where I was going earlier with the, the ethics part of it is our ethics over time have adjusted when we can no longer deny that, yeah, this is a conscious thinking creature who also seems to have emotions, or if they don't, they still seem to be conscious thinking creatures. And we adjust, but we only adjust to the point where, all right, it seems overwhelmingly obvious, we better treat them better. Whereas I've always thought the safer, more ethical assumption, given that we don't know, and we've proven over and over that when we think we know, we don't know because we haven't looked deeply enough. The safer assumption is to attribute consciousness to everything. Treat all life as if maybe, maybe <laughs> they care about their existence. Maybe they have value apart from any utilitarian value we might deem beneficial to us. Well, as a shamanist, I can totally get behind that. Because mm -hmm. it does seem, from my perspective, it does seem to be the case. Yeah. No, and you alluded to the fact that I, I'm not fully on board because I haven't <laughs> had your experiences. And that's true. I haven't had your experiences. So I, I can't be on board with anything I haven't really experienced myself. But rationalist that I am... I feel like I've got some frog friends. I've had friends who were insects, butterflies, dragonflies. Mm -hmm. uh, You've had some really wicked cool experiences I've had some too. crazy experiences that, and with a baseline of anything might be conscious, I'm just not seeing it. The problem isn't their lack. It's, it's probably my lack of seeing because nature is intricate and fascinating and there's a whole lot of stuff we we don't see when we look at it unless we shut up, slow down, and pay attention. And when that happens on a larger scale, as a species, we tend to adjust. And we are constrained by the limits of our beliefs, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you were pointing out before, if right. we and have... Our, our beliefs are it, another big source of how we can be really full of shit <laughs> because we get attached to I, our beliefs. I would I would like to suggest that they are the primary reason why we yeah, are full of shit. I, I'm not going to argue about that, <laughs> Mrs. Halley. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Halley. Bourbon's kicking in. Oh, yeah. This is good. We are having our cocktail night. That's yes. quite nice. We're having a whiskey drink. Let me get back to the honesty 
conversation yeah. for a moment. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the effect or the impact that you're deciding to be honest across the board mm -hmm. as much as humanly possible, except in the instances of safety, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. uh, like if the uh, Nazi Gestapo comes to your door yeah. and asks you if you're harboring any Jews and you are, you say, no, I'm not. Yeah. That's a great example of when it's a good time to lie. Yeah. All right. So I'm curious about what you've noticed with respect to your relationships, particularly with family members. There was an adjustment period. A number of not only family members, but friends didn't like it at first that I wouldn't take part in things that I couldn't, with any honesty with myself, take part in. You weren't playing along? I don't play along. I don't pretend, because pretending is lying. And when little instances will come up, I don't take them as examples to get on my soapbox the way I would have when I was younger, when I was lying to people. So it was kind of a waiting game, and I did my best to coach people through this, like, I'm not going to do things that seem dishonest for me to do. So even, you gave e people a heads up. Oh, Even though you want me to do them, I can no longer do this because of my ethics. Because I've looked at this and I can't be a part of this or I choose not to be a part of this. It has nothing to do with you. You're disappointed that I'm no longer doing this thing that we all used to do. But I'm not going to do it anymore. And I'm not judging you for the fact that you're still doing it, but it would be false for me to pretend. A good example was the celebration of Christmas. That is a good example. Which, for a lot of people, it's time when the fam family gets together. It's something you've always done, so you think you're always going to do it. We're always going to do this together. I kept partaking for a long time just out of habit and for uh, everybody's going to be really disappointed if I don't play along. Were you already feeling like this is not something I want to participate in? Yeah. I mean, when, when I was a kid, the whole, it was all about presents. <laughs> and then later it was all get about, behind that. well, we yeah. can all get together and yeah, giving presents is fun. It really is a kid's, a kid's holiday. I yeah. Think. But people tend to hold on to traditions simply because they're traditions, which is no reason to hold on to a tradition. If it doesn't have meaning, let it go. And it ceased to have any meaning for me, and it became this burden of certain things have to happen on this day. You have to get gifts for everyone who is going to give you a gift. So now, the obligation? It, it was an obligation, which if you have a great idea for a gift for someone, for everybody involved, it's easy. But a lot of times it was like, I don't have a great idea for a gift for, for this person, but I have to give them something. So I'll give them this stupid piece of crap <laughs> just so I can give them something. <laughs> hey, thanks. Or I'll thanks go on so their much. I'll go on their Amazon wish list and get them something they want on this day because I have to give it to them on this day rather than having a good idea, which is a really heartfelt, oh, this is a great thing to do for this person, whether it's an object or an experience or something I make, which are always my favorite gifts to give is something that I've made with my hands. And rather than giving just anything I'm like no well that i remember make any sense. the trajectory we had in our household mm -hmm. so just to give the folks who are listening it an idea john and i have been together we're coming up on our 20 year this is our 20 year anniversary of our marriage mm -hmm. we were Official. to get yeah officially we've actually been together for i would say 23 years right because 97 was when we first met yep so long time and it seemed like we were both kind of coming to the same conclusion yep. in our relationship with Christmas for it's example. It's becoming more of a just obligatory pain in the ass. Yeah like we stopped putting up a tree yeah. I I mean we stopped doing that. No and you then... did that for some years and it was mostly out of habit. Like, yeah. Well, this is what you do. Alright you put some shiny shit on well, the walls. But the, I mean I, I did kind of like the association with it but then when I started thinking about it and the I think what really hit me was the obligatory nature of it, of yeah. feeling like it's it was a financial strain to get presents for everybody. And then it was also the pressure of trying to find the right present for yeah, each person. Yeah, because if you're going to give somebody something, you want it to be a worthwhile thing. And sometimes you're just blank for an idea. Right. And then if you really look at it, you and I are both atheists. 
Yeah, so that, that was another part. That was a big part for me. I don't me. believe yeah. in Santa Claus anymore. <laughs> I never really believed in Jesus. <laughs> so what is Christmas for me but this thing that we've always done? Mm -hmm. And I would rather, my father had a thing that he called Happiness Day. You know this. But these people on the interweb tubes don't. <laughs> so I'll, I'll Please share it. the story of Happiness Day. And Happiness Day for my father was just when he had... It was either just, I want to do something for this person, or he had a really good idea. This would be a great thing to do for this person. He would do it that day, and he would tell you, today's your happiness day. And he would give you a gift, or you'd go out, and you'd have a meal to get. There'd be something. It was your special day. And it was just for you, it's because he was either moved to do something, or he had a great idea. I so love and that idea. So at some point, I remembered that, and it was while we were divorcing ourselves from tradition I'm but like, not each other no <laughs> not yet anyway <laughs> oh make me do too many more of these <laughs> i am such an asshole it was a no-brainer for me to just supplant that with happiness day well when you brought up the idea when you introduced me mm. to your dad's happiness day practice it seemed like a no-brainer. Yeah. It made perfect sense. It's like, yeah, well, it's a, more of a spontaneous. Yeah. And it carries a lot more emotional weight, I think, because you're doing it when you're moved to do so. Mm -hmm. Not because, oh, this is the day we do this, or this it's is the day we do that. Super meaningful. Yeah. Like when you get me something, you say it's a happiness gift or a happiness day. Yeah. It makes, I mean, I just, I feel very special. <laughs> 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 so how did your family take it when you said you know what they I didn't don't... like it yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to do christmas anymore yeah no they didn't like it for a long time in it but then they they came, got used to it came around and they realized i at least i hope they john's... realized that john's he doesn't want to do this anymore no, he's... but he's he's still a pretty okay guy <laughs> and he shows it uh, at least i i hope i'm showing those involved that I care for them deeply in other ways, apart from playing along with this traditional. Not this on is what December twenty fifth. You could say yeah. "fuck them" on December twenty fifth, yeah. but every other day. Every other day, I'm all yours. You're good. And birthdays, I can get behind celebrating birthdays because if you like somebody, hey, it's, it's the anniversary of your birth. Well, that, I can get that, behind that. That day makes sense to me too. That yeah. day and Flag Day. Yeah. Oh yeah, Flag Day is a big one. Yeah. And Underpants Day. <laughs> It's Peruvian. Peruvian under, underpants, underpants day. day. Yeah. Well, it's underpants day in parentheses, Peru. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like the accent. It was nice. Uh, that, that, that's, that's a holiday <laughs> celebrated only here in our house. Yes. Where you actually put underpants on your head. You do. Yeah. One day a year. Yep. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> this is going great. <laughs> it is. My family was thrilled. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't have to do this anymore? Yeah, it's like, I could hear my dad's sigh of relief, like, whew, good, I don't have to buy presents for them. That's great. <laughs> I'm sure we're not alone. Yeah, no. I like, this is, why just feel obligation and stress over Well, it's over fascinating because when I tell people about, yeah, I don't really actually celebrate Christmas anymore, <laughs> there's this like, really? <laughs> <laughs> A little jealousy. <laughs> Um, sometimes curiosity mm. about how that came to be. And then I talk about Happiness Day. Mm. And pretty much everyone I've talked to about the concept of Happiness Day thinks it's kind of a brilliant Oh, yeah. A, a no, brilliant he, he, substitution. he got a gem of an idea there. Yeah. Your your dad was a gem of a guy. He was. Yeah. I'm really glad I got to meet him before he died. Yeah. All heart. Yeah. Giant heart. Let me shift gears a little bit. All right. What's your take on... It's kind of a loaded question, but what's your take on the state of the world? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> you like that one? Oh, yeah. That, that, well, look around. We're just fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, I am fond of saying that the human race is not very highly evolved. No, we're yeah. not. But the sad thing is, is that there's examples that show how good we could be. Because misanthrope that I am. There's lots of humans whom I really admire. People, who, I think, who have done wonderful things, are, have brilliant minds, show staggering compassion. There's plenty of good examples, but they're the outliers. That's what I referred to earlier about 
where I zoom my focus. When I zoom in, I can love an individual human being with all their flaws or whatever. That's such uh, good news. <laughs> <laughs> but when I zoom out and take an honest look, and this is what I think people don't do, again, our brains aren't wired to, to do this. It's not really in our best interest to take an honest look at the whole species because it could be pretty staggeringly depressing <laughs> to look at what we've what we've done. It's an incredible planet that we're fortunate enough to to be here, to have some existence on. And we seem to be turning this incredible place into a big shopping mall. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and trashing it in so so many ways, it's like there must be some evil villain <laughs> with 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 a very small animal on his lap, stroking it <laughs> with an evil it's evil like... look in his eye, and he's got a mustache, of course, behind the scenes, pressuring us to do all the fucked up shit that we're doing to the planet and to all the other life on the planet. So you kind of feel like we're powerless to this. Oh, no, but I'm saying it seems as if there must be some evil genius orchestrating this because gotcha. it's so astoundingly stupid. It is what when you doing. look at it, when you pull out and you look at it. Yeah. The broader perspective. The, the things that we kill each other over. These uh, nonsensical ideas that we're attached to that if you don't agree with, they're worth killing for. <laughs> Just almost seemingly wanton destruction of the only place that we live. And if you look at most other life on the planet, they don't shit where they eat. And we seem to be shitting all over the place. So those are things when you zoom out the perspective, that seems to be, well, it has to be the majority or we, we wouldn't be where we are. Enough of us have either agreed or by not paying attention, tacitly agreed to this is the way we want to live on this planet. It's hard to have... A positive view of the human species given full context if you're really willing to look at it honestly. So how do you manage day to day with that perspective? That took a long time to arrive at actually managing with it in anything other than an unhealthy way. Well because you from being a kid you've kind oh, of had this I've perspective. I've kind of had right? this perspective most of my life. I've always looked around and not agreed with the way humans live in the world. For the early part of my life, it just led to rage. Absolute. I, I was angry. I was your classic angry young man. And the punk era really resonated with you. Yeah, that gave me an outlet for the rage. Yeah. And just via the, the physical energy, the music, but also some of the topics that punk bands were talking about. It was like, oh, some other people care about this and are pissed off too. So, yeah, that was perfect timing in my teens for punk to happen. But you can't sustain that. You can't sustain rage. <laughs> it's uh, your body doesn't want it. It's not good for your head or your emotional self. And it wasn't good for me. It wasn't doing me any good. But I didn't, I didn't know what else to do for the longest time. And then at a certain point, somebody spoke about a similar feeling, but in the terms of grief. And it, I really thought deeply about it because I thought there was something there. And I realized that that's the genesis of a lot of this stuff is I'm grieving for what I see as really kind of sad and unnecessary. So I started allowing myself to grieve rather than just rage about what I saw as all the bad things humans were doing. And the other part of that rage was I couldn't think of any way that I could change it. Because if I thought I could, that would have been the focus of my life. But it's a pretty big snowball rolling downhill pretty fast. And I didn't Into honestly grief. think that, well, no, just the, the state of what we've done to oh, okay. yeah. existence on this planet. Not your experience. I never saw any way I could change the big picture. So that was the frustration part that just added to the anger and the rage and depression, which I certainly suffered in my teens and 20s. But once I thought about that it came from a place of grief, it was sadness. I started allowing myself to when something made me feel that way, just just feel sad. Let yourself feel sad. As a culture, and probably lots of cultures on the planet, sadness, grief is deemed as something negative. Or a weakness. Or a weakness. 
Especially uh, with men, unfortunately. Yeah. But when I started allowing myself to feel that, I wound up overall being way happier in my life. Just acknowledging that, yeah, that's all fucked up and that's sad and I feel sad. But I also, there's nothing I can see that I can do about it. So feel it, move on, and there's still lots of really good experience. There's a lot of good to being alive on this incredible planet. There is. So yeah, that's one of my little, for me, probably wouldn't work for a lot of people, but for me, allowing yourself to feel sad is the key to happiness. Because huh. I lead a very happy existence, and I feel sad a little bit each day. Does that coincide with your insight around being honest? That your ability to, to allow yourself to feel sad, to admit that you actually maybe feel yeah, sad about th this? Yeah, there's probably a tie in there. You brought up the being a man thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had a couple good examples of really strong, what would be deemed very masculine men who were not the least bit afraid to show their emotions, to cry. It took a long time, but eventually those lessons sunk in. And when I gave them a try, I was way happier. <laughs> yeah, that's it's actually a crazy powerful message because it's not one that's embraced in our culture. It's not cool to be vulnerable as a guy. No, but that, to me, that's, that's one of the... It takes a lot of real, actual strength in our culture to be able to show that stuff and be okay with it. Absolutely. Yeah. It actually takes, yeah, a great deal of strength and it's honest. It's honest. Why not let yourself feel what you're, what you're feeling? That seems stupid. <laughs> huh? Well, that's when it's all said and done. Do you have any hope for, I don't know anything. <laughs> Nothing is really pointing in a positive direction right now. If you look at it honestly, you can pick, you can zero in on something and say, hey, these people are doing something good. They're, they're abundant examples of people trying to make it better. That's fantastic. But when you do the math, I don't see things going in a good place. But that doesn't keep me from trying to, there, there's two things that I try to do in this arena. One, I take every step I can to not be part of the problem. That was another part of the accepting, all right, a lot of the shit's out of my control. When you're young, you think you should be able to control everything. And eventually I learned, oh, there are certain things that are not within my control. But if I can't change it, at least I can not be part of the problem. That's one. The other is that somewhere along the line, it occurred to me that it might be a good idea just to be nice to everybody. <laughs> 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 to in, in my little interactions, try and have a positive effect, even if it's just a fleeting, hey, I picked up this cashier's day by, hey, this guy knows my, he, he's learned my name. And because it, it's one of those things I see that so many people shit on people or they don't even see them as human. Oh, people in the service industry. Yeah. Absolutely. We are a pretty arrogant culture. Why times. not have a fun little interaction while you're bagging your groceries? It might pick up their day and it's certainly going to pick up yours to be nice to somebody, to be kind. So yeah, I look for opportunities to be kind. But we're all in the same boat. Yeah. So it's partly for them and it's partly for selfish reasons because it feels good. It feels good to be nice to people. If if you've helped somebody or just brighten their moment, it feels good. It, it's a win-win. It's not going to change the world. And a lot of people try and extrapolate, well, if everybody did this all the time, well, yeah, probably would be a way better place, but everybody's not going to do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> there lies the hopelessness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I, it, it's a weird thing. I don't require hope to enjoy my life. I don't need the promise of a good outcome. Maybe that's one of the re reasons religion never took for me, because I was raised in a religion, but it never took. I don't need the promise of a reward down the road because if you really zoom in and look all we know is that uh we have this moment we might not have another <laughs> we might get a bunch more we don't know we don't know yeah well the idea so that... don't be an asshole <laughs> so don't be an asshole that should be the title of this podcast yeah, yeah. don't be an asshole <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's coming from someone who was an asshole for a good chunk of his life <laughs> a reformed asshole I am. I should start Assholes Anonymous. Yeah. It's a different version of AA. 
Yeah. That would be one I could get behind. I might have some copyright issues with that. I might it, need to come up with a better yeah. name. <laughs> ass A. <laughs> come to the Ass A meeting. Anyway, what you're suggesting is that we don't need religion, which is what I believe. We don't need religion to be a moral, ethical person. No. It's actually, a, from my perspective, a little harder to be an ethical person if you really take the totality of those texts into your brain. We're brought up in a culture that says you get your ethics from religion. I think you bring your ethics to religion and attach them there. Do you think that human beings are inherently good? I think we inherently have the potential to be anything in the full spectrum of really, really horrible to really, really spectacular. And throughout all of our lives, regardless of your situation, the life experience you've had, there's always the opportunity to be either or, or that's the extremes or anywhere in between. It's what you choose. It's all a choice. I don't think there is a fundamental, absolute ethic. There's a, a really good book out there about ethics, which I love. It's by Sam Harris, who's famous for being a critic of religion, but he's a lot more than that. And he wrote this gem of a book called The Moral Landscape, which is a deep dive into ethics and morality. The title of the book, The, the Moral Landscape, is his metaphor that there are peaks and valleys. And he puts two things at the extreme poles. One is the worst suffering for all conscious creatures. And one is the absolute flourishing of all conscious creatures. And then there's everything in between. And it's a series of peaks and valleys. His thesis is that morality should be, the goal should be to shift things more towards the greater flourishing. And I like that he said for all conscious creatures rather yeah. than just us. Exactly. I can get behind that. that. If we let go of superstition and dogma and what we were brought up to believe is true and actually look, we have these brains. We can evaluate, well, all right, here's X. Uh, X is beneficial for this many conscious creatures and not beneficial for that. We can look at this in a sort of objective, rational way rather than how humans have been living for thousands of years, which is referring to obscure texts from the Bronze Age <laughs> to find out about how we should be living. Well, Mr. John Halley, this has been as enlightening and entertaining as I hoped it would be. <laughs> it took a pandemic to get us to actually record yeah. this episode, but I'm really, I'm really grateful to you. Well... It was, it was actually kind of fun, even though I have this weird airline pilot's headset on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In which I sound like a robot to my own ears. And who 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 knows what kind of nonsense I've been spouting uh, here. You're a brilliant <clears throat> robot to me. <laughs> I'm a big fan, John Halley. <laughs> well, you're obligated to say that by law because you're my wife. <laughs> no. I'm saying that because I'm being honest. Yeah. Well, there's not many people I would, I don't know if there's anybody else besides you that I would do this for. <laughs> well, I'm deeply honored then. That's awesome. Thank you for coming on. Certainly. Mrs. Halley, thanks for having me. <laughs> Let's do it again. Maybe. <laughs> Next pandemic. Okay. All right. It's a date. Which could be September. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. So don't be an asshole. I can get behind that. It's been my experience that when people attempt to have an honest conversation and speak from the heart, that it's always helpful. Even if the conversation doesn't go well, you at least have a better idea of where you stand in that relationship or situation. And that's a good thing. Ultimately, it can be hard, but it's good. If you're interested in checking out Sam Harris's book, The Moral Landscape, I've included a link to it in the show notes. All right. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please help me spread the word and share it with a friend or two. Could be a great segue into having a much needed, honest conversation with someone in your life. Until next time, please take care. Mm -hmm.